Good morning. It's uh, time for us to start our, our Bible class. We are uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, is where we've been studying on Sunday mornings. And um, so if you want to turn to Exodus, we're still in, in chapter one. Uh, we had covered a couple weeks ago some introductory material and, and noticed uh, where uh, we're looking at as far as time period goes. And it, it looks like the, the time period of the Exodus is somewhere around 1446 BC, uh, which would put Moses' birth uh, at approximately 1527 BC. Uh, and, and we're hopefully gonna, gonna get Moses born at least today uh, in, uh, in chapter one or chapter two and, uh, and see where we get from there. Uh, but we were looking at uh, the, the, uh, the situation had changed in Egypt. They had gone down into Egypt and, and they were welcomed when they got there. Joseph was uh, second in command, if you will, uh, in, in Pharaoh's household. And um, so he had an important position, but another Pharaoh arose. Uh, who did not know Joseph and put them into uh, slavery, put them under hard bondage. And uh, this uh, Pharaoh looks to be the beginning maybe of the 18th dynasty in Egypt, uh, that this uh, would be the first native dynasty in a long time. They've been ruled for hundreds of years by foreigners and perhaps because of that, because there's maybe some nationalism, they didn't want uh, foreigners involved in, the, in their rule, that uh, they treat uh, the uh, Israelites much differently. Uh, they actually um, were afraid of them because of their numbers and they thought that they might join up with their enemies if there was ever an attack uh, against Egypt. And so that's kind of where we are. Pharaoh had asked the midwives to, uh, to kill the male children, to allow the females to live, but to kill off the male children. And how did the midwives uh, handle that? Did they, did they do what Pharaoh wanted? No. Uh, they didn't, right? Uh, they, they said uh, the, the Hebrew women are lively and uh, they give birth before we're able to get there, which, which looks to be a lie. And so we talked about that last week with regards to uh, situational ethics, that there isn't a situation uh, in which it's okay to lie. God's not okay with lying, but God uh, commended these Hebrew midwives uh, because they feared God uh, more than they feared Pharaoh. And uh, we should do the same. We should obey the government, but if the government tells us to do something that's against God's law, we should fear God uh, more than we fear um, man or, or fear others. So that uh, brings us uh, to verse 20 of chapter 1. It says, Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty, and so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Notice it was because they feared God that God took care of those midwives, that he rewarded them. He didn't reward them for their lie. It's, it tells us what they said, right? And we, we can uh, understand from that that it's, it's not likely true what it was that they told Pharaoh. And Pharaoh likely knows that it isn't true either. Uh, but God's not going to be defeated by Pharaoh in any of this. Uh, and so Pharaoh's plan to, to kill the male children through the Hebrew midwives uh, doesn't work. And so in verse 22, it says, Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. Now it doesn't, in the New King James, it just says every son that is born, but it's understood here that he's not talking about killing the Egyptian sons, right? He's just talking about killing the Hebrew sons uh, here. And, and different translations may have that uh, added in. There, there's some differences in the, uh, in the manuscripts there. But, um, but he is talking about the Hebrew sons. And so now he's telling the Egyptian people uh, to, to kill the male children of the Hebrews uh, since the midwives uh, didn't help him out in any of that. And so he's still trying to, to do something about this. Now, it's in this... Um, context that, that Moses is going to be born uh, at this particular time where they're supposed to be killing uh, the male children. It says in chapter 2, verse 1, then it says, A man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. So we're not given the names of uh, Moses' parents here in chapter 2. It says that uh, it was a man of the house of Levi, and so we, we get uh, that uh, he's from the tribe of Levi, which is going to be important. 
Uh, his uh, wife is also from the tribe of Levi, and so they are Levites. Uh, and we don't find their names until later. If you come over to Exodus chapter 6, there's a genealogy that's given in Exodus chapter 6 uh, of the sons of Levi. And in a look at verse 20, it says, uh, Now Amram took for himself Jacobed, his wife's his father's sister, uh, as wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137. So we get the names of Moses' parents there in chapter 6 and verse 20. His father's name is Amram, and his mother's name is Jacobed, and they bore both Aaron and Moses. Um, and what, who's Aaron going to be? Well, Aaron helps them to get to the promised land, yep. He's going to be Moses' spokesperson, right, when he comes into Pharaoh. Aaron eventually is going to be the first high priest, that God's going to choose Aaron. And in order to be high priest, you've got to be in Aaron's lineage. And in order to be a priest, you've got to be from what tribe? Levi. Right, so we see in this that he's going to be from the right tribe. He's going to be from the tribe of Levi. Now, we don't have this yet in the text here in, in Exodus chapter 2, but Aaron is three years older than Moses. And so we didn't have this issue with the children being killed, the male children being killed, when Aaron is born. And so we see that this is a narrow uh, time period, if you will, uh, that it happens at the time of Moses' birth, but Aaron is three years older. And then there's also a sister, uh, and she's going to be a little bit older uh, than both Aaron and, uh, and Moses. And the sister will be involved uh, here as well. And so she sees that he's a, a, a good child or a beautiful child, and so she hides him for three months. How many of you have had little babies in the house? How hard would it be to keep them quiet for three months? I don't know how she kept them hid for three months, right? Because at some point, you're not able to hide them anymore, right? Ch children, uh, they make noise. And uh, you, you can't really put a muzzle on them or a muffler, right? There's, there's no way to, you know, to, to, uh, to silence that. Uh, but at some point, she's not able to hide, them any, hide him anymore. And so she's going to basically put him in God's hand. She puts him, she makes an ark, if you will. Right? She makes an ark for him, this little basket, and she puts, daubs it with pitch. Well, can you think of another ark that had pitch to keep it sealed? That saved Noah and his family, right? And so there's kind of a parallel here that, you know, Moses is saved in an ark, kind of similar to how Noah and his family were saved uh, in an ark, that she, she puts him in this uh, ark and uh, she puts him in the reeds, it says, by the, the river's bank. And so in verse 4, it says, his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, we know Aaron's three years older than Moses. We don't really know how much older uh, Marian, uh, Miriam is. Miriam uh, is his sister. Now, she's not going to be named until, I think, Exodus 20 is where we, we pick up her name. But his sister's got to be a little bit older because she's able to kind of watch uh, the basket, and she's going to see what it is uh, that happens, uh, what's going to be done to him. In verse 5, it tells us the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Uh-oh. She knows that it's a Hebrew male child, Right? So in Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, uh, where you've got this revelation scene that all of a sudden everybody finds out that Moses is a... He she knew from the very beginning, right? The Bible sheds a lot of light on the movies uh, and commentaries and those sorts of things. Um, the, the Bible tells us that she knew it was a Hebrew child, right? Maybe the way that it was dressed, maybe the fact that uh, he was probably circumcised. But we see that she's able to, to tell that it's a Hebrew child, so she knows right away. Now, Pharaoh has said, I, I want all the male Hebrew children to be killed. And here's Pharaoh's daughter, or a daughter of a Pharaoh, uh, who finds him and has compassion on him, and so she's not going to kill him. She's going to disobey Pharaoh's order. His sister 
said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? that She may nurse the child for you. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And so the maiden went and called the child's mother. When Pharaoh's daughter, then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman, woman took the child and nursed him. So Moses' mother, she's concerned about Moses being discovered. She puts him in this basket, puts it in the river, and lo and behold, there's Pharaoh's daughter coming down to the Nile uh, to bathe. Now they thought that the Nile was basically a god, and that if you bathed in the river, that that was going to somehow grant you fertility. And so she's coming down to bathe in the Nile River. It would have been maybe her custom. And who knows if Moses' mother knew uh, that she was coming down there or that she would be down there at that time of day, that maybe there's some, some premeditation here, that maybe she knows something about Pharaoh's daughter that l leads her to believe that maybe this will go. Or the text doesn't tell us. All we can do is speculate about that. Uh, but Pharaoh's daughter sees it. Now, when we talked about who this might possibly be as far as who the Pharaohs would be at this particular time, this might be Hatshepsut, who was the daughter of a Pharaoh. She was the daughter of Thutmose I. But she was also married to a Pharaoh. She was the aunt and the stepmother uh, of Thotmes III. And so she may not be the daughter of the current ruling Pharaoh, but she's the daughter of a pharaoh, and for a time it looks like she was actually a co-regent uh, over uh, Egypt. And so you think, all right, well, well, who would it be that would be in Pharaoh's household, right, that would be Pharaoh's daughter, who would have the, the kind of chutzpah, right, or, or the kind of authority uh, or backbone to be able to keep this Hebrew child as her own and raise him as her own uh, against the wishes of Pharaoh? Well, she may have had that kind of that kind of power if you, when you look at uh, Egyptian history. And so it's, it's interesting to think that um, this, this might be uh, Hatshepsut here who pulls, her, pulls Moses uh, out of uh, the river. Later on in the plagues, what's the first plague that's gonna happen? I thought I heard somebody say it, but you gotta say it a little louder. What happens to the Nile? Turn, turns to blood, right? And so they thought that the Nile was a god. Well, what do you think that means when the, when the Nile turns to blood, right? What it, God is basically going after all the Egyptian gods and the plagues, and we'll see that when we get to chapter 7. We won't get there today. <laughs> it may be a couple weeks at the pace that we're going before we do get there. But when we get to the plagues, we'll see that every one of those plagues, God is addressing and God is taking out one of the Egyptian uh, gods or several Egyptian gods uh, in each one of those plagues. And so she noticed it's, it's the, one of the Hebrews uh, children here, that it's a, a Hebrew child. And so she tell, Miriam comes to her, right? Miriam's been watching what's going on, Moses' sister. And so she comes to Pharaoh's daughter and she says, do you want me to find a nurse for you? And she says, sure, go ahead. And so she gets Moses' mother to come nurse him and she gets paid for it. Now that's good work if you can get it, right? She's going to get to nurse her own child, and she's going to get paid to do it, right? And she doesn't have to worry about him being killed now because uh, he's, he's going to go into, into Pharaoh's daughter's household. And so the child grew. Uh, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. He became her son, so she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. And so it looks as if Pharaoh's daughter here is the one who names Moses that. Now you think about Thutmose the first and Thutmose the second and Thutmose the third. Mos, Moses is kind of part of the Pharaoh's name there. And so it could be that because that, that is kind of maybe a family name, right, within Pharaoh's household that she names him Moses because there's some similarity there. It's kind of like Theodore and Theo, right, that they maybe just shorten it a little bit. But Moses in the Hebrew means to draw out. And if they've got Hebrew slaves, it's likely that she's able to speak Hebrew or she understands Hebrew. And as a Hebrew child, she names him Moses, which would be Hebrew for, for drawing him out because she drew him out of the water. And there's an interesting thought here too because she drew Moses out of the water and what's Moses going to do? He's gonna draw his people out of Egypt, right? It's an appropriate name for him that he's the one who's gonna draw them uh, out of Egypt. 
Names uh, meant something, I guess, in the Old Testament. They always named uh, their children, you know, based on something uh, that, that was uh, in their life. Isaac, right, meant laughter. And because Sarah laughed and Abraham laughed when they were told they were going to have a child, they, they named the child laughter. Uh, you know, we don't really do that anymore. We don't, you know, I don't know what we would name the children when they're born, you know, little, little red thing, you know. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know how we would, uh, how we would do that now. But, uh, but the names usually meant something uh, in the Old Testament. And so she names him Moses. Now it says in verse 11, It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now we're not told anything else uh, about Moses' childhood. Right, Moses is born. Uh, there's a danger of him being killed. He's rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. He's going to grow up in Pharaoh's household, if you will. And Stephen, in his defense in Acts chapter 7, makes mention of Moses growing up uh, as an Egyptian, that he was learned uh, as an Egyptian. But we don't have anything else about Moses' childhood because now he, he's about 40 years old when this takes place, uh, according to Acts chapter 7. And so in his first... 40 years, and, and basically you can break Moses' life down into three 40-year periods. The first 40 years of his life, he's uh, raised as an Egyptian in Pharaoh's household, uh, in, in uh, Pharaoh's daughter's household, and that, that takes his first 40 years. His second 40 years, uh, he's going to be a shepherd uh, in the land of Midian, and then God's going to call to him when he's 80 years old to go into Egypt and to lead his people out. And the last 40 years of his life, we know he spends... Uh, with, the, with the Israelites, leading them out of Egypt and, and wandering in the wilderness. And so you can break Moses' life down into three 40-year uh, periods. And so when he was grown, that he, he goes out and he, he knows that he's a Hebrew. He sees uh, an Egyptian uh, who is beating uh, a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that in verse 12. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Right? This is not... Uh, manslaughter. This is not, uh, you know, second degree murder. Uh, he looked this way and that, right? He, he thought about it ahead of time uh, and he struck the Egyptian and, and uh, killed him. And so he hides uh, his body in the sand and he thinks, okay, uh, maybe he's going to be able to, to get away with this, uh, but um, that's not going to be the case. It says, when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting and said to the one, and he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptians? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. So he tries to cover up the fact that he murdered the Egyptian. He buries his body in the sand. And we might wonder from this, does Moses believe that he's the one who's going to be the deliverer of the Israelites. But he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and he, he takes matters into his own hand. He's going to, he's going to provide justice, if you will. The, they, the Hebrews knew, right, that at some point they were going to come out of Egypt, didn't they? Because they, they didn't have anything written yet. Moses is the one who's going to write the book of Genesis. But what was it that God had told Abram about the land that he was in, in Canaan. He says, I'm going to give this land to your descendants, right? But not yet, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16. But at some point, right, in the fourth generation, they're going to come out of there. They're going to come out of Egypt, right? They're going to come out of, of where it is that they are. And so they would have had this oral tradition. They would have had this, this oral teaching that they would have understood at some point God's going to lead them out or that they're going to be able to come out of Egypt. And so does Moses think maybe he's that person? Because now, you know, here's someone that's, he's a Hebrew, but he's, you know, in Pharaoh's household. He's educated as an Egyptian would be. And maybe he looks at this situation and he thinks, well, I'm the one who can do this. I'm the one who can t take the lead here, if you will, that he comes to these two men that are quarreling. And he says to the one, why did you strike your companion? Now notice the response of the man who is striking the other when Moses says that. What's his response? Who made you a prince and a judge, right? Why does he respond that way? Because that's how Moses is acting, right? Right. 
assume we have to assume that because we, we have a dead period of time. He was he was taken in and and came out. We always say he was raised there. I don't guess we technically know that because the Bible doesn't tell us that. Well, yeah. <laughs> Right. We, we know that he was taken into uh, Pharaoh's daughter's household, right? Um, but yeah, we don't know a whole lot about those first 40 years. But it's because of the language that he uses, right? The language that he uses, why, did you, why are you striking your companion, is language that a judge might use. And the way that it's worded, it's worded in a way that a judge would say that. And because of the way that it's worded and, and how Moses is interceding here, uh, that this man says, well, who, who you know, kind of who died and made you boss, right? Uh, who made you a, a judge and a prince over us, right? And um, so it, this seems to indicate that maybe Moses is acting in a way where he may think that, okay, I'm, I'm the guy who's going to be able to do this. I'm going to be able to be the, the intermediary uh, here. Um, in Acts chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, that's where we pick up uh, that Moses is 40 years old uh, at this time because the text doesn't tell us in Exodus. But in Stephen's defense in Acts chapter 7, uh, he, he says that uh, Moses was approaching 40 years old uh, at this particular time. So Moses finds out that uh, his, he's, um, his killing of the Egyptian is known, right, that these... Uh, Israelites know that he killed uh, the Egyptian, and so he's afraid because this thing is, is known, right? Uh, that it's not a, a secret. Uh, and so he says, surely this thing is known. In verse 15, when Pharaoh uh, heard this matter, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So when Pharaoh hears that Moses has killed an Egyptian, uh, he's seeking for him. Uh, this appears to be Thotmes the third. If we're right about our our time periods here, uh, Moses would be 40 years old, somewhere around um, 1487, 1486 BC. We're in that particular uh, time period, and uh, if we're right about our dates, then Thotmes the third uh, would be uh, the pharaoh at that time. He's going to rule uh, up until about 1450 BC. So he's going to rule for a while yet, and so. Moses flees uh, to Midian. Now, if you're looking at the map of where Egypt is, if you come out of Egypt and into the Sinai Peninsula there, the, I guess you'd say it'd be the right-hand side of the, or the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula, and then across on the other side over into Arabia would be kind of the area uh, where the Midianites uh, were. And so he goes uh, into that particular area when he flees. It's, considered to be wilderness area, and so it's not likely that, that Pharaoh's gonna chase him down there or know particularly where it is that he, that he went. And so he gets there and he sits down uh, by a well. Now it says in verse 16, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So here's Moses, he comes to this well in Midian, and he's sitting there, and, and these seven daughters of Ruel have come to water their flock, and there are others who are trying to chase them away, but Moses intercedes again. And so you kind of see that with regards to his character. Right? He's interceding for the Hebrew against the Egyptian. He's interceding for one Hebrew who's being mistreated by another. Now he's interceding for these, these women who have come to, to water the flock. Moses is going to intercede for the children of Israel. And we'll see that you, you, when you read the Pentateuch, you see that throughout the story. That the Israelites continue to, to whine and to complain and to, to they, they build a golden calf for themselves, right? They do all of these things to anger God. And who's the one that goes to God over and over and over again on their behalf? It's Moses, right? They complain about Moses. They complain about Moses' leadership. And yet he still goes to God on their behalf. And so we see something about the character of a great leader, right? That Moses doesn't take it personally and say, you know what, you're complaining about me, you're on your own, right? We sometimes would do something like that, right? We would, we would tend to write people off and say, well, if you're going to treat me that way, if you're going to act that way, I'm not, I'm not going to help you out, I'm not going to pray. But Moses 
doesn't do that, right? Moses uh, is, is a great leader. And so Moses uh, intervenes here. And so we see this as part of his character uh, that he intervenes. Now it says that in this land of Midian here, there is this, um, this priest of Midian, right? In verse 16, the priest of Midian had seven daughters. So this man is a, is a priest, but we don't have the Mosaic law yet, right? He's not from the tribe of Levi. Ruel isn't, right? He's a Midianite. And so he's not part of that wing of the family. But he doesn't have to be in this particular time period in order to be a priest to God. In Genesis, we, we have a character, this Melchizedek, that Abram met uh, along the way, that he gave a tenth of the spoils to. And Melchizedek blessed Abram, and it says that he was a king of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. And so there were priests in the land uh, of God that before the Mosaic system, because we're still in the patriarchal time period. So don't uh, confuse that as far as the, the history goes, that we're not to the Mosaic period yet when for the Hebrews, you've got to be a, a Levite in order to be a priest. These are other folks that are in the world. And so you've got this priest of Midian. His name Ruel means friend of God. Uh, usually if you see someone's name and it's got L in it, L is the Hebrew word for God. And so if it's Joel, right, uh, then you know that that's got God in there somewhere, right? Jehovah is, is God, right? The Lord is God, Jehovah from Jehovah and L from, from God, right? So uh, Ruel uh, here means, a, his name means a, a friend of God. And so Moses helps these daughters, and they, they come home, and he says, why are you home so early? Right? It didn't take as long as I thought. And they said, well, we had help. Uh, and they said that it was an Egyptian, right? So however his upbringing was in those 40 years, when he's here sitting by the well of Midian, he appears to be Egyptian, either by his hairstyle or by his style of dress. There's something that identifies him that he looks like an Egyptian, which would maybe indicate to us that he's been living as an Egyptian for those 40 years. Comments or questions on anything? I just want to say something about, you said that the meaning of the name Moses is drawn from the water. Well, if you, if you look at the big thing that he does is he draws his people out of the water just as he was himself drawn from the water. Yeah. Red Sea. The Red Sea, yeah. 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 So, that, yeah, that's, you can make that parallel. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing how things work on, on God's schedule and, and uh, you know, how, how God makes things come to, come to be, yes. right? Uh, almost like he knows what's going to happen ahead of time. I think it's interesting you made the comment about Moses being put in at the river, you know. I think it's interesting because you made the story else we know that and you stopped it at, the, at, at, at Noah. But you think about how are we saved today by water? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Noah was saved by water, right? Moses was saved by water, and we're, we're saved through water and baptism. And Moses did the wrong thing with water once. He struck the rock. Yeah. He was supposed to speak to it. Yeah, yeah, he, he uh, was, well, there was one occasion where he was told to strike the rock earlier, yeah. and, then, and then the second occasion he was told to just speak to the rock, and he struck it twice, and um, because of that, uh, Moses wasn't allowed to physically go into the promised land, and uh, that happens in Numbers chapter 12, that he, that he strikes the rock, right, when he's supposed to speak to it. But yeah, there's water involved there too. Yeah, Taylor, you wonder, I wonder how Moses knew so much about his heritage. At three months old, he was given away. You know his mom had to spend time teaching him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't, uh, you know, his, his mother nursed him for a while. And, and nursing here in this particular time period, right, they didn't have, they couldn't go to the store and buy formula, right? Which I guess during COVID or part of COVID, we couldn't go to the store and buy formula either because there was a shortage of it. But they didn't have that, right? They didn't have formula. They, they couldn't go down to Kroger's and get a gallon of milk, right? To feed. So when they nursed the child, they would normally nurse the child. And you see this especially with um, Hannah and Samuel, right? That it's probably in the, in the neighborhood of three to four years, 
right? So she would have had time to be able to teach him some things about his heritage, or he would have known some things about his heritage. Um, and they know what it is that God had told the patriarchs, right? They knew what it had been spoken to Abram. So they would have had that oral history. Uh, but yeah, Moses didn't forget where it was that he came from, right? And um, there's a lesson in that for us too, right? We need to remember where it is that we came from, that we're not, right? We, we sometimes think, well, I'm a self-made man or, you know, I've, I've done this or I've accomplished so much. Well, God's allowed us to have the ability to do whatever it is that we've done. We need to remember uh, where it is that we've come from and, and be humble. And when it comes to humility, the Bible tells us that Moses was the most humble man. Now, if Moses wrote that, I'm not sure if he lost his humble card, right? The minute you write, I'm the most humble man, wouldn't you like lose that award, right? But, you know, but he wrote by inspiration. So it's not Moses calling himself, you know, the most humble man. Um, I sometimes say in a world of mediocre people, I'm the most mediocre. Um, but, you know, so he, he kept his humility, right? He remembered where it was that he came from uh, in all of that. And so he helps uh, these women, but they, they think that he's an Egyptian, right? Because he appears to them, manner of dress probably would have been uh, that of an Egyptian uh, at this particular time. And so they say that this Egyptian uh, has helped us. He delivered us from the hand of the shepherds and drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So Ruel says to his daughters, and where is he? Why, why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Ruel says, well, he's helped you. You, you need to show some hospitality. Uh, to him. You need to be thankful for what it is uh, that he's done for you. Call him uh, that we can give him something to eat. It says that Moses was content to live with the man and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. And she bore him a son and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And so again, we've got this not a lot here about this whole 40 year time period that Moses is in Midian, but over the course of these 40 years, uh, he marries Zipporah, one of the daughters of Ruel. Now later on, Ruel is gonna be called Jethro. Um, don't let that be a complication to you. A lot of times folks, maybe Ruel, friend, you know, the uh, friend of God, maybe that was uh, a nickname that he had, and maybe Jethro uh, was, his, was his given name, right? We, we have that with Barnabas, that Barnabas was a nickname, right? It meant son of encouragement. That wasn't the name that he was born with. And so we see folks in the Bible that have uh, different names, but later on he's gonna be referred to as Jethro. But he gives one of his daughters, Zipporah, to Moses, and Moses marries her, and they have a son, and his name's Gershom. Now, Gershom means stranger. Right, so he names his son because he's been a stranger in a foreign land. This, this isn't you know, the land of the Midian, Midianites, right? being in Midian. That's not uh, his native territory. Uh, he was born in Egypt, but he's, he's a Hebrew, and the land of promise is, is up in Canaan. And so he's kind of a, a stranger in a foreign land. But no matter where we are on this earth, are we not also strangers in a foreign land? I was born in Ohio. I lived in Colorado for a couple years. I lived in North Carolina for a while. I've been here in Tennessee for a little over seven years. Right, well, where's home? Home's in heaven, right? I'm a stranger in a foreign land and that we are pilgrims, right? And that's the kind of the mentality that we need to have rather than saying, well, I'm in Ohio. Now I, I bleed uh, scarlet and gray when it comes to football season, but you know, I'm a native of heaven. Right, and that's the, that's the place that I wanna to go to. That's the, I'm homesick for a home I've never seen, but here we are wanderers and strangers. And if, I think if we have that kind of attitude, it kind of helps us, doesn't it, with materialism and physical possessions and where we're gonna live and where we're gonna hang our hat and those sorts of things. I'm Northern by birth, but Southern by the grace of God. That's what I tell folks. <clears throat> Good move. The winners are a lot better down here, I'll tell you that. We all don't, y'all don't have winner. You think you do, but y'all don't have winner. <laughs> so he uh, names his son Gershom, right? And again, the name meant something because of the fact that he's been a stranger in a foreign land. Verse 23, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. So, so now we're gonna fast forward, right? The king of Egypt dies. Well, if that's Totmes the uh, third, he dies in 1450. Now the Exodus is somewhere around 1446, so we're getting real close, right? So 
the, the Pharaoh uh, had died. The children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God, hearing their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abram, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. So, again, we're, we're fast forwarding here to now Moses is 80 years old or approximately 80 years old when this takes place. The, 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 the Pharaoh that sought Moses' life, he has died. And there's a new Pharaoh uh, again in Egypt. And the children of Israel are crying out because of their bondage. They've been in slavery. We don't know exactly how long that is. But if it, if it correlates with the beginning of the 18th dynasty, then, then we're looking at them being in slavery since about 1570. And so from about 1570 up to this time period, they've been in slavery for a while. They were in Egypt a total of 430 years, but that goes back to when Joseph first went into Egypt. And so they weren't slaves uh, all of that time period. But they're crying out to God because of their, the bondage. They're crying out to God because of, of the slavery. Now notice, they're crying out to God. Why? They understand that at some point that they're going to come out because of the promises that were made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so they know that at some point God's going to deliver them. God's going to give them the land of Canaan that he promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, right? And so they know that that's going to happen. And so they're, they're crying out to God and saying, we want to come out of here. Now they're going to forget all about this when they get out into the wilderness after they leave Egypt. Because they're going to talk about, boy, we had, oh, we had, it was so good in Egypt. Oh, we had cucumbers, we had melons, we had leeks. You know, we ate meat to the full. And all we have out here in the wilderness is this worthless manna. Very ungrateful uh, to God for what God was providing for them in their complaints. And so sometimes, you know, we've, we've got a, a short memory with how bad things are sometimes. But they're going to forget just how bad things were in Egypt. But at this point, they're crying out to God for deliverance. And so it says, God remembered his covenant with Abram. Now, it's not that God forgot. Oh, yeah, I forgot I, I had that, right? I forgot I did that. I've, we're, we're moving out of our house on... Monday and Tuesday, I guess. And um, I got some paperwork to transfer. There's a warranty on the windows and on the gutter guards, and I got to remember. Right? I might forget that paperwork and have to fill it out and then drive back over there and deliver it to the new residence if I forget it. So I might forget things as a human being, right, to forget to do. God doesn't, he didn't like forget the covenant. He remembers it. What does that mean? It means, all right, the time is now. Right? He remembers because the time is now, according to God's timeline, right? They're going to come out of here, but it's going to be according to God's timeline. And it all has to do with the iniquity of the Amorites. Now, he wants his people to want to leave Egypt, right? We, we noticed last week that Egypt was having a bad influence on them because, and we'll get this in, in uh, the evening sermon tonight. If you come back tonight, uh, there's a treat for you. We're going to talk about um, uh, Joshua's farewell address. Right? And he says, choose this day who you're going to serve. But in that, he says, put away the gods that your father served in Egypt. Right? Well, at the end of Joshua's life, they still have some trinkets. They still have some idols left over from Egypt. So Egypt's having a bad influence on them, and God wants them to want to leave. He wants them to get out of there, right? To, to not have that, that negative influence anymore. And they're at the point where they're crying out, they're ready to go. But on God's timeline, he has to wait for the iniquity of the Amorites to be complete because he's not bringing the Israelites and putting them into Canaan because they're such good people. It's not the case at all, right? He's bringing them over there because he's, he's pushing the Amorites out of, and the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites. He's going to want to push all of those people out of the land because of their iniquity, because of their sins. And so don't think that Israel's getting this land because of how good they are. They're not. They complain, they whine, right? Israel, the name Israel that God changes Jacob's name to means wrestles with God. And Israel certainly wrestled with God over and over and over again. They were a stubborn, stiff-necked people is how God describes them. And, and we'll see that they, they deserve uh, that description as we go through this. So God hears their groaning. He looked upon the children of Israel and he acknowledged them or he had care for them, right? God has chosen Israel to be his own special people. And God has the right to do that as the creator. And so his acknowledgement of them just basically means he has care for them. He has concern for them. He has compassion for them. And he's going to draw them out 
of Egypt, and Moses is going to be the guy who's going to do that, and we'll see that in chapter 3. Comments or questions in our last two minutes? What is it? No. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay, so my question is, he left Egypt. When he left Egypt, he had previously believed that he would be the one to deliver them. But now he's 80 years old. He doesn't want to go back to Egypt. He doesn't want to leave me. So what's his thought process? Has he given up the idea that he's going to be the deliverer? It could be. He, he may, you know, when God calls him to go in, he, he does make, I think it's five different excuses, right, to not go. Uh, none of those excuses are, well, I'm afraid that Pharaoh's going to kill me, right? So he's not afraid of Pharaoh killing him, right? Because God tells him at the very beginning of this that the Pharaoh who sought your life is dead. But he makes these excuses. Now, Moses, I, what was his mindset? Hard to say. But it could be that he thought, okay, you know, I tried this 40 years ago and it didn't work. Right? I tried to be the leader 40 years ago, and it didn't work. These people, they're not going to listen to me. I don't have a message. They're not going to follow me. I'm nobody important. I'm nobody special. I can't speak all that well. Right? He's going to make all of these different excuses, and it could be that I, you know, well, we tried that, and it didn't work. And sometimes congregations will do that, too. They'll say, well, we can't go knock doors because we tried that before, and it didn't work. Or we can't send out newsletters because you know, uh, we tried that before, and it didn't work. People who live here may be different than they were 10, 20 years ago, Right? Well, yeah, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Marcus? Can you in, uh, expand a little bit on who was Pharaoh during the actual exodus across the sea? Uh, because there, is, uh, there are differences uh, among... The, there's differences among scholars. There are some who think that it's Ramses II because of the mention of the name Ramses. But Ramses, uh, as far as a territorial name, shows up back in Genesis 47. So it looks like Ramses was the name of the territory before that. Ramses being Pharaoh in the 1200s, it's too late. And it doesn't match the archeolo archeological evidence. It doesn't give enough time for the uh, judges time period before we get to the kings. And so it, it 12, 1200 BC doesn't work for that. But if we're right about our dates being 1446 for the Exodus, then Amenhotep II, uh, who ruled from 1450 to 1420, uh, would have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And so the, the early date for the Exodus would have him as Pharaoh. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you for your participation and your uh, attention this morning.